Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this tour of the solar system. My name is Ethan, and I am a planetarian at the Academy of Sciences, and I am also not Josh. So if you've been to one of these before, you will have seen Josh give a show, a tour of the solar system, and this one will be like that, but also different, because I'm different. Uh, and we are starting here at home, actually the site of where I'm broadcasting from, planet Earth, which is objectively and uh, unsurprisingly the best planet. We're going to go check out some other places in the solar system, but none of them will have quite as much as our planet here. And that's no shame on them. It just goes to show you how awesome Earth is. Now, We've got pretty free reign in this show to go wherever we would like, and so that means that I am open to taking requests. In fact, it's actually really helpful if you have questions about a place you'd like to see or uh, there's something you wanted to learn about, uh, please put it in the comments, and my producer Rook will pop them up and we can go check them out. It's much for, more fun that way than me just talking about space. I mean, I'm going to be talking about space either way, but uh, about seeing your favorite places, not just mine. But before we go too far, let's check out the moon. Um, the moon is an incredible place, and one of the best things about it is that it is very close by. We are leaving Earth behind, and you can see there's a bunch of orbits out and about. Those are far in the distance. This one here, however, is much closer. Now the software I'm using is called Open Space. You can learn more about it at openspaceproject.com. It's being developed by, I think it's openspaceproject.com. Yes, uh, and it's being developed by NASA or at least funded by NASA. Uh, and we are helping them get it ready. It is currently available and free and open source. So if you're interested, I encourage you to check it out. It is an inc incredible way to take a look at kind of all of the data we as humans have about places like this here moon. Now this is the moon. I suspect almost all of you, if not all of you, are familiar with it uh, because we get to see it. Most nights, or I guess not here in San Francisco, theoretically you could see it most nights. There's only a few nights each lunar cycle where it is exceptionally hard to find. Uh, and here we're seeing it in a way that people normally don't. We get to see its craters up close, like we had an incredibly powerful telescope. We see there is a lot of variety here on the lunar surface. Now, not nearly as much variety as there is in a place like uh, Earth or even Mars, which is where we'll head next. But the moon does have a number of distinct features. They're actually best seen from far away, or at least they're more familiar from far away. You can see there are some lighter areas and some darker areas. They are different colors because they're different. It's kind of a silly thing to say, but we tend to train ourselves to ignore color. You know, like a white Toyota Prius is basically the same as a red Toyota Prius. We, we train ourselves to ignore color, but in space it really matters. The reason these are darker colors is because they're made up of a slightly different kind of rock, a little bit more mafic, mantle-like rock, but also they're way flatter. We can tell if we zoom in, like way in, that these areas don't have as many craters. In fact, if we pan down to uh, the highlands area, or, or one of the highlands areas, you can see there is a lot more craters here. In fact, there are so many craters, they kind of overlap each other, whereas the moon has these big flat areas too. But let's head elsewhere. Let's go to Mars. Yeah, Mars is an incredible place, and it is kind of like the Earth's uh, little brother, in, in a way. Um, uh, Earth is rocky. We call it a terrestrial planet, or rather we call all planets like Earth terrestrial, because we get to do that. We're the center of our universe, so we get to decide that kind of thing. And Mars is one of our terrestrial planets. Here we are seeing the four terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And you'll notice that Mars is farther from the sun than we are, which means it gets less sunlight, which means it's colder. 
Now that's at odds with what seven-year-old Ethan thought, um, because Mars is red. That's like its defining feature. It's it's bright red. And so if you're me and a kid, you think red means hot because I watched too many cartoons. And uh, the reality is Mars is farther from the sun than we are. So it gets less sunlight. So it's not warmer. It's colder, like much colder. In fact, it's like Antarctica in that it's incredibly dry and very cold. And it's a similar temperature range too. We actually sent a spacecraft here called uh, Insight, which gives us daily weather reports. And for a while, I was really good about checking them. Uh, but I stopped because they are the same every single day. During the day, it gets up to a balmy negative six. And during the night, it gets down to like negative 160 or something like that. Also, the air is incredibly thin and very dry here. But it is another place where humans could conceivably live. Not because it has anything for us that makes it easy to live, but because it's not actively hostile the way other things in the solar system are. Uh, Mars has some really gigantic features for being such a small planet. Let's see if I can track one down for you. Uh, you can see it's got ice caps just like ours. And we've also got some humongous features like this giant scar here. Um, I call it a scar. It's a giant valley. It's called Vallis Marinaris, or Mariner Valley, uh, and it is humongous. It is incredibly deep. It's about seven times deeper than the Grand Canyon and about as long as the United States is. One of the great things about this software is that you can really get up close to this kind of stuff. This is data taken from orbiting satellites that we then process, give it a height uh, value, and we can see sort of the scale of this thing in a way that you kind of can't looking at it through a telescope. No knock on telescopes, but, but seeing it like you're there is, is, a, is a very different experience. Let's, uh, let's check out not just a giant canyon, but a humongous mountain too. This is often talked about. So you, if, you've, uh, if you've seen this before, bear with me. First thing I've got to do is turn off nighttime on Mars. Don't worry, the Martians don't care. Uh, and we're gonna go check out Olympus Mons, which is the largest mountain in the solar system that we know of, which is a caveat we always have to add. Now Olympus Mons is humongous and it's still very dark. So I'm actually just gonna cheat and we're gonna time travel uh, a couple of hours forward. Hopefully, let's go and let's put Let's put Mars's giant mountain into the sunlight. Now this mountain is humongous. It's about three times the height of Mount Everest, despite Mars being a much smaller planet. Uh, and it is actually so tall, this is my favorite factoid about it, that it pokes up out of Mars's very thin atmosphere. So if you want to be an astronaut and are somehow on Mars and not already an astronaut, all you have to do is climb to the top of this mountain and you go out of the atmosphere, which is poor planning. Uh, and, unless you've got a spacesuit, I guess, and some really good hiking boots. At its base, it's about the size of a state like Arizona, uh, which is humongous. Uh, all right, let's go elsewhere because we've talked about Mars for a bit. Um, I saw a request for the sun and what else to visit but the center of our solar system. The sun is familiar. We, uh, we see the sun like every day, maybe nowadays, not as much as we have in the past, but the sun is where we get all of our energy from. It is a star and stars are very generous with the energy they sort of pour out into the universe. This is, for kind of all intents and purposes, a self-contained, self-sustaining thermonuclear explosion. And in it, we've got the most incredible thing in the universe happening, uh, which is two hydrogen atoms get under such extreme pressure and under such extreme heat that they smash into each other. They get so close that instead of just bouncing off like hydrogens pretty much everywhere else in the universe do, um, it it becomes more energetically favorable for one of them to just 
stop being a proton and start being a neutron. Because physics. Because uh, it can. And in that process, it gives off uh, energy in the form of heat and, and, and particles that fly out and they heat up the sun. And that is why the sun is so bright. Uh, or rather, it's not because of the fusion, but rather because of its heat. The sun is bright because it is hot. Like your electric stove or a charcoal and a barbecue, it is giving off light because it's hot. Now it's like 7,000 degrees on its surface, so it's very bright. Uh, but there's no magic to that. In fact, if you heated something up to 7,000 degrees here on Earth, you can make something as bright as the sun. Let's go elsewhere. Let's go check out another object. I think I saw a request for uh, Jupiter and its funny face. So this is something that uh, is very fun to visit, if you ask me. Uh, and that is Jupiter, which is the only other thing in the solar system that matters other than the sun and, of course, me. It is humongous. It is so big that even though it's farther from the sun than we are, we notice its effect on the sun. It causes the sun to wobble in a way that our telescopes can detect. It is huge. And the more we study the solar system, the more we find out that Jupiter is kind of a bully. Um, it, over the course of our solar system's history, has routinely taken things and sort of thrown them around like a spoiled child. Uh, and that's good news and bad news if you're us. Like, dinosaurs had it pretty good for a couple tens of millions of years. It's only been a couple of tens of millions of years since then. So if there hadn't been an asteroid that was flung inwards by potentially Jupiter, we might, might not be here. But also, it's kind of a spooky existential threat lo looming over all of us. Uh, Kind of a weird direction to take talking about Jupiter, but uh, let's talk about something that's much more charismatic. And that is a little storm that has a name. Not the Big Red Spot, though the Big Red Spot definitely has a name. Uh, but a storm that has been named lovingly J J Jovi McJupiter Face, or J Jovi McJove Face, something like that. I think it's currently hiding in the nighttime side of Jupiter. Or maybe not. Uh, welcome to the future, nothing works. Is that it? I don't know. These storms all look the same to me. I've never been good at finding it. Uh, here's something that looks like a face. Let's flip it around. This doesn't look like it exactly, but it gives you a sense for these circular things and humans uh, penchant for making things into recognizable characters, even on things like Jupiter. Yeah, sorry I couldn't find it for you. Here's another one. That one looks particularly distressed. Uh, let's talk about why things are spherical. Yeah, so things in space kind of form two shapes. One is the ball, like Jupiter. Jupiter is a perfect example of a ball. It is round. It is spherical. Uh, the other shape is something more like our solar system. So our solar system is not ball-shaped. In fact, it is more frisbee-shaped. Let's go check out Saturn, too, because Saturn's a good place where we can see both of these. Um, the reason things have the shapes they do is because of the forces at work. Or, or rather, the, the reason anything has a shape is because it is in equilibrium. For example, if I've got this ball here, this is rather cubic. Uh, maybe not the best example of a ball, but it is handy. Um, the reason it is where it is is because gravity is pulling it down and my hand is holding it up or resisting that, that motion due to gravity. Uh, if I was to let go, it would change its position. It would change its shape. Same thing with, say, a planet. A little patch of planet, uh, like let's do this little bit of Jupiter's atmosphere here, is where it is because its pull of gravity is being offset by pressure from the stuff below it, or because of its motion. 
A planet like Jupiter or Earth or anything compact like a moon is the shape it is because gravity is pulling in and it is being opposed by pressure, which pushes out in all directions. You've got a spherical pull in and a spherical pressure sort of pushing out, resisting that. I'm using things like forces uh, and pressure, and it's all kind of physics-y. Uh, because this is fundamentally a physics problem. There's kind of no way around it. Um, so objects that are dense, that are being resisted by pressure because they've got a spherical force pulling in and a spherical force sort of pushing out, form spheres. But let's take a look at something that is distinctly not spherical, like Saturn's rings. These rings are the shape that they are because of the forces at work. If we zoom in on them, Unfortunately, I don't have the ability to target one. Uh, the rings are not solid. Even though they sometimes look that way, you'll see that they are kind of distinct bands. And if we could zoom in even further, we would see that these bands are made up of individual chunks of stuff. Turns out it's mostly water ice. There's some impurities. Uh, but the reason they are this shape is because of the f opposing forces, so to speak, the opposing uh, factors at work. One being gravity pulling in, which is spherical. And it's being resisted not by pressure. It's not because these chunks are literally bouncing off of each other, but because they're moving. They are moving too quickly. They have what in their reference frame you would call a centrifugal force pushing outwards. And that counteracts gravity pulling in. But of course, that doesn't act in every direction. It only acts kind of counter to the direction they're moving. It's like spinning a ball of pizza dough, how it moves out as it spins. Things that spin really quickly have a lot of energy flatten down to disks, whereas things that are denser, like an unspinning ball of pizza dough, have a force pulling in, like gluten or gravity, that makes them spherical. Now, you do have things that are a mixture of the two. For example, Saturn's a good example of this. It's not perfectly spherical because it is spinning and its atmosphere is moving quite quickly. The winds in the upper atmosphere of things like Saturn and Jupiter move really quickly, and so it kind of smushes itself out. The sun does it to a certain, or at least some stars that are spinning really quickly do it too. Earth is oblate too. We actually uh, are farther from the core when you're along the equator than at the poles because that motion is counteracting gravity, allowing it to kind of sit farther away. But this acts all the way up to sort of the galactic scale. Uh, the galaxy is disc-shaped because it is sort of spinning and it has a gravitational force that is flattening it spherically, but it is only being resisted kind of in, in, in two dimensions. It's symmetry, not in the artistic sense, but in the physics sense, which is way cooler to way fewer people. Um, all right, let's go check out somewhere else. We have other questions. Uh, do other planets or moons seem like they could have life? Uh, let's talk about a moon out here that could potentially have life, and that is Enceladus. Now, some of these uh, objects in our, the software show up as little gray circles. I'm hoping Enceladus isn't one of those. Uh, or rather that it looks like the gray circle it in fact is, uh, because it is covered in snow, or ice, rather. This is one of Saturn's moons, and even though it is incredibly far from the sun, in fact, I can give you a view of the sun from here. Let's do that. Let's, let's take a look at the sun so you can see just how small it is. That thing right there in the middle is the sun. We are so far away that we get 1% the amount of sunlight that we do from Earth, which is to say that here on the surface of Enceladus, it is really cold. You basically just don't have, uh, don't have sunlight in the way we do here on Earth. And yet, Enceladus has features on its surface that imply that it is really active. You can see all of these scrapes, uh, these shifting features here. These are peculiar. Things like craters, we would expect. But these long streaks, these fissures, tell us that Enceladus is a, a lot more active. Let's see what fun layers I can bring here. Oh, this one says texture. What does texture do? 
Uh, it adds a little bit of texture, I guess. Um, when we're talking about Enceladus, it doesn't just have active or evidence of activity on its surface in the form of these long streaks and, and canyons, but rather we have seen cryovolcanoes or, or volcanoes shooting water in, out into space with it being smaller. It, the momentum of the water is enough to get it off of Enceladus. Cassini, which flew by Enceladus, uh, saw some of this stuff launching into space. And in fact, we have tracked a band of ionic charged particles orbiting around Saturn that we think almost certainly came from Enceladus. It has some huge source of energy inside and those particles are like ionized water, or at least some of them are, which is to say that it's got the ingredients for life or at least the astrobiologist ingredients for life, which is water and energy. Um, let's, uh, there are a few other places in the solar system that might potentially harbor life, but the places we look for need bare minimum those two things. Uh, let's talk about the Milky Way in kind of a, a, in the way that we see it from here. Uh, I've tried this in the past, unfortunately, uh, the Milky Way, we don't have it modeled in, in open space, but what we can do is look at the Milky Way from basically anywhere in the solar system. The Milky Way being this big, beautiful, long scrape in the background. This from here on Earth looks different. This is composite imagery built by telescopes that have eyes that are better than ours. Supposedly there are places on Earth, I've never lived in one where it does look akin to this, or, or at least more like it. Uh, but what we are seeing is the plane of our galaxy spread across the sky. From sort of an outside perspective, this looks like a big whirling disk, but from inside, we don't get to see it that way. And in fact, anywhere in the solar system, we see it basically the same. Uh, we're in a very, very, very small place. Uh, yeah, let's see if my, if my, uh, if my GPU can run the, uh, the volumetric universe as we zoom out. Um, before we do, let's take a look at all the orbits of all the planets. Um, you'll see way out here, they're kind of clipping. You can see Pluto here. Pluto is as far, uh, as most folks would, are familiar with the solar system. There are further objects out here, like the Oort cloud and the Kuiper belt. Uh, but that's still small potatoes. Like, to get to Pluto at the speed of light, it takes you four hours. To get to our next closest star at the speed of light, it takes you four years. Which is a really big jump in scale. Four hours to four years is like sitting through a particularly long graduation and the entire college experience. Or at least if you can manage to do it in four years. Uh, let's keep going out. You'll see now we start to see the other objects move. This is usually when my computer stops rendering uh, the rest of our galaxy. But before we go too far, let's talk about what these dots represent. Each one of these is a star, like the sun. Most of them are not exactly like the sun, but they range in size. The sun's pretty average. Uh, some of these stars are humongous. Some of them are really, really small. But each one has the potential to have planets. In fact, when we look at where we find planets in the solar system, or in the universe rather, they're kind of all over the place. Or rather, they tend to be centered around us, not because there's a limit, but because they're everywhere and we have a hard time finding them. Some of these are orbiting stars that are like the sun. Many of them are not. So when we're thinking about what it's like out here, planets are out here, stars are out here too. And our solar system is um, not particularly unique. All right, let's see if we can get to that volumetric model of the Milky Way. And it's not looking promising. I wonder if there's a button I should hit. Stars, universe, galaxies, home label. No, nope, that didn't do it. Here's a picture of the Milky Way. Oh, maybe we just zoomed too far. Uh, yeah. Welp. 
<laughs> let's uh let's head back home because that is uh dissatisfying to uh to conclude with. Let's uh let's head back home to uh to our planet. Cause although there are lots of other planets out there, none are quite like Earth. None have everything that we need. None have everything that we have, except for Earth. And it's gorgeous. You know, we've, we've visited a few of the other places in the solar system. I think Saturn is beautiful in its own way. Uh, Jupiter too. But like, none have everything that Earth has. Even the moon, which is close by, is best. The best, most beautiful thing about the moon is the view of Earth, if you ask me. Um, because we really have just a huge amount of variety. And that variety is part of what makes Earth so important. There isn't really quite anywhere like it that we have found yet. Not to say that there won't be later, but this is truly all we have for now. And so it's kind of us on us to keep it as nice as we can for as long as we can. This is um, where I'm going to leave it. Uh, we're going to fly back to, uh, to San Francisco and I want to thank you all for, for joining me, uh, in these uncertain times doing stuff like this. I at least find really, really, uh, humbling and a reminder that the earth is big and, and we are small and our place within it is important if only because we're the only animal as far as we can tell that can appreciate it like this, like as it is, with all of its weather on this humongous scale and its place in a universe that is much bigger. So once again, thank you. That's all the time I have. Uh, be good to one another. And uh, I hope to see all of your smiling faces at the Academy as soon as we can reopen. Thank you so much. and. Uh, have a wonderful evening.